Okay, back in the box. As ever, we, we can never escape. Like that particle that's trapped in the infinite potential well, you can never escape. Um, we will be coming back to this time and time because it, it's it's often described as quantum physics 101 in terms of the particle in a box. Um, yes, it's our starting point, it's our kickoff point, it's also where we return to, but it's deeply subtle. There are very many subtleties about a particle in a box. It's not like this is the lowest level of quantum and then you move up from there. Particle in a box itself still has many um, aspects that are difficult to understand, even though it's effectively entry level quantum mechanics. Um, so let's explore it a little bit more. I would stress once again, hang on, where's the particle gone? It escaped. There it is, it's in the bin. Oh, I know why it's in the bin. Um, if you've watched the previous videos, you'll know why it's in the bin. Stop thinking of it like this. Just get that idea out of your head. Yes, in the classical limit, if we take a quantum system and go to the limit of the classical case, and it's very, very big, or we increase the temperature, we think about how the energies are changing. Yes, there's got to be a correspondence between the quantum system and the classical system. But if you're thinking about a quantum system right at the quantum level and you've got this model of a particle bouncing back and forth, you are going to be even more confused. Um, so just get that idea of your head and think about waves and strings. Um, last week, was it last week? Yeah, last week um, did a computer file video with um, Sean Riley on um, superposition. If you want a non-mathematical sort of, you know, gentle entry into superposition, um, it's worth perhaps watching that video. Um, not least, not least for him. He's great. Uh, come on, focus, focus, focus on monkey. Focus. There we go. Yeah, anyway, for the computer file video, just for him alone, it's worth watching. Anyway, let's add a little bit more mathematical meat um, suitable for a second year undergraduate um, quantum physics course to that. Right, our system is this. You know what I'm going to draw, but let's just draw it again one more time. U1, U2, U3 eigenstates of the Hamiltonian that satisfy this eigenvalue equation. However, our overall quantum state, let's call that psi, as a function of x and t, position and time, doesn't have to be just one of these states doesn't have to be u1 or u2 or u3, it can be some mixture of those states. Just as when we pluck a string on a guitar, or you hit a key on a piano, and you set that string into oscillation, there's a mixture of modes. That's what superposition is. It's a linear combination of those modes. We are saying that our overall wave function, let's say, let's just discuss it at t equal to zero to start off with, is equal to some combination of modes. Let me just do that. Our overall quantum state or overall wave function is described by some linear combination, superposition to use the language of quantum mechanics, of our basis states. In this case, the basis states of the Hamiltonian. And these CNs, just as in Fourier analysis, so we started off with Fourier series, remember? The CNs define how much of each basis state we have, and they can be complex valued. They can be complex valued. Um, we're going to see examples where they're just real valued initially. Um, we might move on to examples where they're complex valued, but actually that just adds in a little bit more complexity. Um, that is not necessarily helpful in terms of you getting an understandable understanding. So we can just make those real you know, so a half of u1 plus a half of u2, or a third of u1 plus a third of u2 plus a third of u3. And what we find, as described in the last video, in terms of the probabilities, is that the probability of measuring one of these states is directly related and is very simply related 
to these coefficients in that it's just the modulus squared of these coefficients, or if the coefficients are real, it's just the square of those coefficients. That's the Born rule. So, we've got our spatial dependence. How does our um, temporal dependence, how does our dependence of time work? Well, remember that what we have, if we have just, let's consider just one of these states. Let's say we are just in this we set up our quantum state, so what we have is we're just in the um, first uh, eigenstate. We're just in the first eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Let's say that's it. That's, that's our system. How does that evolve in time? So that's in terms of x, t, we will have, remember we did this previously, let me get on the right side of the board, and let me move this actually. Uh, Let's get that out of the way. So how does this depend on time? Now we're just, I'm talking about, and this is critical, talking about a system whereby we're just in the first eigenstate, or I can choose one of those eigenstates, but just one of those eigenstates. So what we'll have is this. Remember, Time independent, sorry, time dependent Schrodinger equation is separable into a spatial part and a temporal part. That's our spatial part, and our temporal part which is effectively just minus i omega t. But I've deliberately expressed it in terms of E1, which is the energy eigenvalue associated with that eigenstate. That's what our quantum state looks like. Notice, if we just take the modulus squared of this, the probability density, then what we have, this is a real function, so that's just going to be squared. e to the minus i e1 t over h bar times complex conjugate of that e to the plus i e1 t over h bar gives us 1. So what we end up with is something that has no time dependence. Our probability density has no time dependence. Hence, we call each one of these individual eigenstates a stationary state. But not every single state is a stationary state. Otherwise, quantum mechanics would be very, very boring. So we can write, um, for example, we could set up our system so that It's, say, uh, 1 over root 2 u1 plus 1 over root 2 u2. Why do you think I've written 1 over root 2? Why are the coefficients set like that? We'll come back to that. But that's our overall state. Now, that's a mixture of those two states. And if we now take this and we think about what the time dependence is, of this state. Let's put that in. So, if that's our initial state, our state at any time t is really straightforward to write down. Really straightforward to write down. In that it's just going to be 1 over root 2. Remember that's just a function of, of x. I would be specific and put that in. e to the minus e1 t over h bar, just as we had before, plus Hopefully you can see where this is going. 1 over root 2 u2x e to the minus i e2 over h prime. Now you can say, well, okay. I hope that you can see that what we've done there is basically write uh, n c n u n e to the minus i e n t over h bar. That's how we define our state. Hope you can see that. Can you see that? E to the minus, maybe, if I just move it up a little bit. Yeah, okay. Hopefully you can see that. But here's the really important thing, and we're going to switch over to a simulation. So I show you this on the computer, and it really makes a big difference when you can see this actually moving, as it were, to really hammer home what's happening here. But now, you might ask, well, if that's our state, what's our probability density look like? That's our wave function. What's our complex conjugate look like? 
where our complex conjugate is going to be. That's going to be the same. That's going to be the same. That's not going to be the same. It's going to be I e one t over h bar. Similarly with this. So, now what we want for our probability density and how that varies in time is to take the product of these two things. And hopefully you can see where this is going. So just bear that in mind. That's our um, original wave function. That's our complex conjugate. And what we're going to have when we take psi by psi star, which is our probability density, which is now a function of both time and space. Uh, let me do it like this, just to hammer that home. What's that going to be? Well, that's going to be um, 1 over root 2. Let's do it. Let, let me put it all back on, on again. U1, e to the minus i e1 t over h bar plus 1 over root 2 u2 e to the minus i e2 t over h bar multiplied by, let's do it like that, multiplied by 1 over root 2 u1 e to the plus i e1 t over h bar plus 1 over root 2 u2 e to the plus i e2 t over h bar. Note. What we now have is, okay, we've got a half u1 squared. Similarly here, we're going to have a half u2 squared. And these are functions, remember. But now what are we going to have? For these, we're going to have a half u1, u2, but this isn't going to disappear. What we're going to have here is e to the i e1. 2, sorry, e to the i e1 in this case, this is positive, e1 t over h bar minus i e2 t over h bar. We're going to have one term like that and then we're going to have, if you'll excuse the cramped writing, but hopefully you can work this through and I'll put it up in better writing up here u1, u2, e to the i, other way around, we're going to have e to the minus i, e1, t, h bar, and e to the plus i, e2, t over h bar, so what we have then is a half u1, u2, e to the i, e2, minus e1, t over h bar, and similarly we could reduce this, e1 minus e2, t over h bar. Right? So, now when we have a mixture of states, and the crucial thing is now we have terms that are time dependent. This thing, these don't cancel out to become one. Similarly, this doesn't cancel out to become one. We have something which is going to oscillate with an angular frequency. Remember, I e t over h bar is equivalent to I omega t. We have something with an angular frequency depending on the difference in the energy of those two um, eigenstates. Uh, and that's going to set the frequency at which this oscillates. So an individual eigenstate by itself is time independent. It's a stationary state because its probability density doesn't change with time. A mixture, a superposition of eigenstates in this case, we focused on the um, Hamiltonian, so eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, i.e. energy eigenstates, energy eigenfunctions, whatever you want to call them. In that case, once we have a superposition, then we have time-dependent terms whose frequency depends, rate of oscillation, depends on the difference in energy of the eigenstates that make up the overall quantum state. This is all going to make a lot more sense when we look at a simulation. So let's go and look at a simulation. 
Okay, so let's take a look at this in real time, as it were. So, what we have here on the screen is eigenstates of the Hamiltonian for the infinite potential well. You can see we've got um, the uh, box, the edges of the box here, where the eigenfunction goes to zero. Those are our boundary conditions. And what we're plotting is the real and the imaginary parts of the wave function. You can see psi x t, overall quantum state. And then down here we're plotting the probability density. We can also normalize that. So, let's just set this up so we've got only the first eigenstate, as I did on the board first initially. So, notice what's happening. We have certainly got um, oscillation, but we've got oscillation in the real and imaginary parts due to that e to the minus i e1 t over h bar term, or e to the minus i omega 1 um, t term. So they oscillate back and forth, but because what we need to do to get the probability density is obviously take the modulus squared, that phase term, that e to the minus i e1 t over h bar, drops out, and we're left with a stationary state. That's for our first eigenstate. Let's do it for another eigenstate. Let's say we've got an overall quantum state psi that is just our second eigenstate. Notice it oscillates. How much faster does it oscillate? Is it just twice? How much faster would you expect it to oscillate? I'll leave that question to you. Think about it. Notice again, we've got a stationary probability density. Eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Stop, and let's just to hammer this point home once and for all. We go to the third eigenstate. And it's oscillating really quickly in terms of the real and imaginary components due to that phase term. But again, the probability density is fixed in time. It's stationary. Well and good. Now let's move to a mixture of eigenstates. Let's set our C1 coefficient to a half. And our C2 coefficient to a half. Now, given that the squares of the coefficients should add up to 1 for a properly normalized state. You might say, what's going on here? Don't worry, I make sure that this overall probability density is normalized. So the area under this is 1. So these are basically just factors that the relative ratio of these is, is important in that it tells us that we've got equal mixtures of C1 of the first eigenstate and the second eigenstate. But those particular values of C1 and C2 are not normalized correctly in terms of the overall probabilities. But don't worry about that. It all comes out in the wash because the overall quantum state is, is normalized. T equal to zero, we just lose those phase terms. However, a T not equal to zero, we most definitely do not lose those phase terms. And look what happens to the probability density. It's no longer stationary. And the reason it's no longer stationary is, is we have that oscillatory term that I've just gone through on the board in terms of the E1 or E2 minus E1. We've got a term that's proportional or terms that are proportional to the difference between the energy eigenvalues between the first and second eigenstates here. Or we can add in a third eigenstate. It stops the simulation when I do that. Let's say we've got equal, equal amounts of the first three eigenstates. So let's make that 0 0.33, 0 0.33, 0 0.33. Equal amounts of the first three eigenstates. And notice what's happened to our probability density. It's oscillating widely and it's oscillating much more rapidly because we've got in that third eigenstate whose energy isn't just um, three times E1, because for the infinite potential well, our energy eigenvalues goes n squared, we've got something which is nine times um, the overall energy. Hence, we get a much faster oscillation frequency. What you need to take away from this is energy eigenstates are stationary. A mixture of energy eigenstates, i.e. a superposition of energy eigenstates, is most definitely not stationary. In terms of what happens when we now make a measurement of energy in this system, 
We'll get to that very soon. Before that, let's do a worked example. Go back to sort of the analytical maths type of exam question, very similar to the type of problem you, you could get as an exam question, very similar to the type of problem I set as an exam question uh, last year. At least some elements of it. So um, let's do that. That's what the subject of the next video will be. See you then.